to all who are weary and need rest, to all who mourn and long for comfort, to all who fail and desire strength, to all who sin and need a savior. Christ Church opens wide her doors with a welcome from Jesus himself, the friend of sinners. Well, good morning, friends. Welcome to Christ Church. It's Pastor Ryan here. I'm the vicar of Christ Church Oceanside, um, and it's my joy to welcome you to church today. For all of those who are part of Christ Church, we miss you. If we haven't been able to see you in person yet, I want to give a few kind of announcements uh, right off the the bat today, just to kind of inform you of a few things. We are reassessing just about everything about how we're doing church online. Um, And so we're just trying to readjust and revision um, to understand the needs of the next year, because it seems to us that there will be an ongoing need for those within our parish to receive church online. There's still going to be hesitations. There's still going to be illness. There still will be limitations from our government. So we're going to be balancing a lot of things here in the next few months. So please be patient with us. I know we are kind of hoping by this point in September that we'd have our full-fledged liturgy up on Sundays. And so we're still working on that. We have a lot of uh, exciting things coming. We have new people who are getting involved in doing church online and things like that. So there will be some stuff coming out in the next few weeks, some more clarity and a more robust service online. So the full Anglican liturgy, preaching, readings, response, everything. So please just be patient with us as we figure that all out, okay? And the other thing is this, is that meeting in person is actually going really well. We're really encouraged by it. We're very excited. It feels fantastic to be in a room together singing. I think the, um, even I noticed this past Sunday, just the joy, the difference, the anointing even that's present in preaching when we're gathered together. The um, the transcendence at meeting at the Lord's table and sharing and partaking together. Um, so I understand if you can't be there for safety's sake and things like that, but please know it is safe and it is really um, beneficial and enjoyable. Now I wanted to pray uh, a prayer this morning. Um, As you know, we have our field guides for daily prayer. It's kind of like a condensed book of common prayer to the really just essentials that you can keep in your pocket. Mine's getting pretty well worn, but I think it adds character to it. Um, But I want to read uh, the prayer for the local church today and just know that my heart is very much with you. Almighty and ever-living God, Ruler of all things in heaven and earth, hear our prayers for this church family. Strengthen the faithful, arouse the careless, and restore the brokenhearted. Grant us all things necessary for our common life, and bring us all to be of one heart and mind within your holy church, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And Jesus, I ask that as we worship together today, as we open the scriptures, that your presence would be with each one in their home, that you would enliven our hearts with faith to engage deeply and intentionally with your presence and with the revelation of your scriptures. Let us not fall back into a lukewarm heart because of the limitations of this pandemic, but instead enliven them, fire us up within with passion for Christ and a hunger for your presence, we pray. Amen.
our Father everlasting, the all-creating one, God Almighty. Through your Holy Spirit, conceiving Christ the Son, Jesus our Savior. I believe in God our Father, I believe in Christ the Son, I believe in the Holy Spirit, I've got a sweet and one, I believe in the resurrection, that we will rise again, for I believe in the name of Our judge and our defender Suffered and crucified Forgiveness is in you Descended in the darkness You rose in glorious light Ever seated high Sing it out, I believe I believe in God our Father I believe in Christ the Son I believe in the Holy Spirit, our God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection, that we will rise again. For I believe in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is Lord. Oh, sing it again. I believe. I believe in you. And I believe you rose again. And I believe that Jesus Christ. I do, yes I do I believe in life eternal I believe in the virgin birth I believe in the saints communion And in your holy church I believe in the resurrection When Jesus comes again For I believe in the name of Jesus I believe in God our Father, I believe in Christ the Son, I believe in the Holy Spirit, our God is three in one, I believe in the resurrection, that we will rise again, for I believe in the name of Jesus, yes I believe in the name of Jesus, for I believe in the name of Jesus Yes, I do oh, oh, oh. I believe in you I believe who rose again I believe the Jesus Christ is Lord You are here Moving in now I worship you, I worship you You are here, working in this place I worship you, I worship you 
Stop working, even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, never stop working. You never stop, no, that is who you are. It's who you are. It's who you are. It's who you are. You are we make a miracle worker. Promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Our scripture reading this morning is from Romans chapter 12, beginning in verse 9 through to the end of verse 20. Let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. 
Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink, for by so doing you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. This is our story, the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, we're continuing our series here on finding friendship in the way of Jesus. And I'm having fun. I'm enjoying this um, cultivation and thought process and really asking the question, how does Jesus uniquely lead us into friendship and how does he make it possible in a world that's full of sin and brokenness and autonomy and difficulty and polarization, how does Jesus make this all possible? I think increasingly it shows the need for friendship with Jesus. That Jesus is the one that actually cultivates in my relationship with him the ability to have friends and to have deep and rich and meaningful friendships. Because Jesus awakens and opens my heart, he leads me to be present in friendships, to be self-disclosing, to embrace and be embraced. Um, I'm just finding more and more it's this idea of seeing Jesus present within the relationships I'm actually longing for and seeking to cultivate. So I want to give a few points before we get into this text of scripture in Romans 12. I think if you're looking to go, okay, how do I actually, you know, the vision's presented and it's lovely and it's beautiful. And of course I want that. How would I begin to step into friendships with what we know so far? I want to give um, just kind of four quick points here on what that would look like. I think the first is see Jesus anchoring you in the midst of the friendships you have or the friendships that you're trying to engage in. So Jesus is your anchor. So Jesus is with you and present with you in a relationship when you're trying to cultivate it. And see see that. See that Jesus is there with you and he is speaking to you saying, you're meant to be here. And I'm here with you. So tether yourself to him to see yourself as connected to him and with him and secure in him. Then from that place, you can begin to engage more deeply, truly, genuinely with the other person. Because you know that your needs that are going to inevitably arise in this moment and in this friendship are met by Jesus. So he's my anchor and I'm tethered to him. Then see Jesus nudging you, nudging you to be truly present, the real you, the honest you, no facades, no masks, you know, no, not uh, projecting or presenting something you think they'll like, but the real you. And so for, um, for the more extroverted personality type, I think part of what we can see in ourselves as extro- extroverts is that our outgoingness is actually a fear of quiet or a fear of of leaving too much space for other people because we're afraid they're going to hurt us. So I can be quite extroverted at times. And my temptation is to eclipse the moment for fear that if I give too much space, it'll be discovered there's no room for me here or nobody wants me here or people are going to hurt me. So the extrovert is going to get nudged by Jesus to go, you don't have to work so hard. 
Be fully present. Have fun. Be outgoing. But don't do it from a place of desperation or control. Just do it genuinely from who you are as a person. For the more introverted type, who I am also very much like, Jesus is going to be nudging you in a different direction. Jesus is going to nudge you forward, saying, take up more space. <laughs> You're allowed to be here. You're allowed to have a personality and opinions. You're allowed to have likes and dislikes. Jesus is going to nudge you away at a party from just going in the corner and petting the cat or wrestling with the dog or burping the baby. Right? These are the things that introverts look for is outs. Can I have a reason to be technically present bodily, but internally safe and removed and separate? Jesus is actually going to be nudging you towards taking up space, being fully there, speaking your mind. And you might go, oh, all the things I love, nobody else loves. That's not true. And, that, and that's part of the lies that's going to pull you away from community. You want to enter into it because Jesus is making space for you. And then the third thing is this, is that we talked about confession last week. I think it can become a bit heavy and misleading when we go, confessing is just about talking about my sin. I had a few meetings this week where people were like, um, or where we were standing up to leave and I was going, well, I'm a little disappointed you know, you didn't take time to confess your sins to me. Now, as a priest, that can have a different connotation. But I think after last week's sermon, people are like, I love the idea of that. I don't know how I ever begin to engage with that. I want to give a few pointers on that. Confession isn't just about confessing my sins to one another. Confession is also about showing up and saying, this is how I'm really doing. Being honest about where I'm at and what's going on in my life. And being able and willing to share both the biggest joys in my life as well as the biggest struggles. Sometimes we can hold back the extreme ends of our lives, our stories, and try and present something that we think is more palatable. Instead, what we want to do is say, here's my highest joys that I want you to know about so that they can participate with you in that joy. Because we know a joy is never full until we're able to share it. Have you ever hidden a joy in your heart? But it doesn't feel the same until you can share it with other people. Now with struggles, we want to be able to say, this is what I'm really going through. This is what I'm really feeling. This is what I'm really having a hard time. This is what has hurt me. We want to be able to share the full breadth of the human experience in friendship. So all of that is an expression of confession. To be able to say, here's my highs and here's my lows. And then to be able to say, not only are these my struggles, but this is where I think I'm, I'm failing. I'm crumbling under this. I'm making mistakes here. I think I blew it. That kind of honesty leads to very real friendships. So not only to be able to share that about yourself, but to be able to make room and space and, and draw that out of our friends to say, how are you really doing? What are your biggest joys and struggles? How can I celebrate with you? But also, how can I grieve with you? Where are you blowing it right now? And how can I be with you and receive the power of the cross to that? That kind of honest friendship that can ask real leading questions. Do that. Pepper people with real questions to say, I actually really want to know. And create real space to hear it and to be with them in it. And then at that moment, when the truth is out, that's where we truly can embrace. Where we're moving from friendships that are more about two people trying to negotiate how to be in the same room together, to togetherness, oneness true unity and friendship where I'm in this with you and I feel what you're feeling to the best of my ability. I care about what you're going through. I'm celebrating with you and I'm also grieving with you in your struggles. Your pain is my pain, 
My faith is your faith. My struggle I'm allowing to become your struggle. That So those are kind of four keys that I would recommend to be working on. One, be anchored to your friendship in Jesus. Two, let Jesus nudge you in the direction you need to be nudged. Three, confess. Be honest about your life with your friends. And four, embrace one another in the truth of real life, real friendships, real heart, real love and embracing. To hold one another. So you should be communicating or growing in your ability to communicate from your heart when you meet someone, I'm in. This handshake isn't just a handshake. You've got me. I'm present. I'm with you in a non-intimidating, non-self-serving way. Now, you might start feeling like, wow, this is a great vision of what's possible in Jesus, but this isn't even everything. Um, We've looked at how his life, the life of Jesus and his divinity and humanity lead us into friendship. We've looked at how the cross at the center of friendship can save us from um, how sin would seek to separate. Now the cross brings us closer. Now what I want to look at today is how Jesus' resurrection makes friendship possible. Friendship in like a life-giving, breathing, invigorating way in our life. That friendship shouldn't always and only be just deep, but actually should be very life-giving and fueling and invigorating. And so we see this in Romans 12. It's a fantastic section of scripture. The whole reading was just needed for our times, but I want to focus today on verses 9 and 10. So let's read those again together. Let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Here, Paul captures what's at the heart of Christian relationship. And he does so after spending 12 chapters unpacking doctrines, deep theological truths about the person and work of Jesus and how it leads to our salvation. And then to take time to talk about relationship is important because we see that so much of the fruit of the gospel is relational. That the truth of Jesus saving people should lead to people able to have meaningful relationships cross-generational, cross-gender, all of these different, you know, different cultures and people coming together and finding friendship because of the work of Jesus. Now, he starts off this phrase with something we shouldn't gloss over. It's very significant. It's not just a statement, it's a command, and it's this, let love be genuine. The way of Jesus is genuine. Okay, so the salvation that Christ promises and offers always talks about internal realities coming to external transformation. And so the inner life of the person is what Jesus has his spotlight on. So he, he does, the whole point of the way of Jesus is not to go, now you need to love other people without addressing the fact that internally we are not loving towards other people. Internally, we tend to be towards, you know, conflict or competition or even hate. And so Jesus wants to reorder the inner life to make the external expressions possible and genuine, true. And so what I could not change in myself, Jesus does for me. So what Paul's saying here is that love shouldn't be fake. And we know fake love. It actually should give you shivers. After everything we've already talked about, the idea that you would fake love is actually quite terrible. Because it's the opposite of love to fake love. So what is disingenuine love? It's expressions of love without true substance or true motivation. 
We know that feeling when we would say that somebody has, somebody is doing things, doing loving things to me, for me, but I don't feel loved at all. And this isn't like a, somebody's loving me, but I, have, I don't have the capacity to receive it because of wounding and trauma in my life. This is a, I'm open to be loved, but what they are doing to me, even though it has the appearance of love, doesn't have the true reality and substance of love. So it's expressions of love, but they're motivated and generated inside the person by self-serving motives. So they're actually doing it for themselves, not for you, which is the absolute um, opposite of what love is. And you, when you have that moment where you can see somebody is saying kind words to me or doing a kind thing to me or saying they're loving me, maybe it's even giving a gift, but behind the, their eyes, you can see the soul in these micro expressions coming through their face that you can tell they, they're saying this because they think it's the right thing, but I know they don't feel it or believe it. And that's actually really quite gross. That's a gross feeling. To hear that or, or to feel that or receive that from somebody else. Now, the, the next thing then is this, is that true genuine love comes from a place of knowing that you're loved. And this is why Christ is so important, is that I need divine love to fully satisfy me truly internally. So I need to know I'm loved by Christ, know I was made for love in Christ, and that I cannot help but from that wellspring of love, want to love other people. And I'm going to, of course, I'm going to find myself going, ooh, I struggle to love here, or I've run out of love here. And I have to go replenish that love from the love of Christ. But there's no excuse to live a fake life of love when in reality you're internally bankrupt of it. Paul is saying true relationship in the way of Jesus must be genuine. Now, if you find yourself going, yeesh, I'm doing all these things that I know are supposed to be loving, but I know internally I have none. You've got to pull back, do less in order to find true love in Christ, that the fuel would be genuine for it. Paul goes on, abhor what is evil, hold fast to what is good. Our love is not passive or permissive towards evil, especially when that evil threatens to hurt the person we love. We do and must speak truth in our friendships when evil presents itself. Okay, so we don't want to be blessing something that is destroying them. But we don't want to allow evil to intimidate us into leaving love. And this is what I find, it comes up a lot for me as a parent, when I see evil or sin present in the life of one of my daughters. And I see either they're dabbling in it, or it's attacking them in some shape or way or form in our world. I can get fearful. I can get intimidated by evil. And in my fearfulness, I can resort to evil things to try and save my kids from evil. I can revert to anger. I can just strongly, harshly um, correct them when they're not actually deserving of that. I can seek to shame them out of participating with evil, which is not true to the way of Jesus. I can even respond in hatred towards the evil that my kids misunderstand is hatred towards them. Paul doesn't want this. Paul wants us to be able to abhor what is evil, like loathe evil in this world, not want to participate in anything that is harmful. But he ties it in the sentence with a greater truth. Hold fast to what is good. So don't allow yourself to let go of love in your attempts to combat evil. 
Where this ends up coming up in how I speak to my friends is when they present some sin or evil in their life that has them. My response is not to just gloss over it, but to say, bro, that's not who you are. You don't need that in your life. You're too valuable to live like that. What's being communicated there? I'm holding fast to what is good. What's good? Them. I love them. And so I want to hold fast to what is good, even though I'm addressing and speaking the truth to something that I think is evil and harmful. Because if it's God's kindness that leads us to repentance, then my judgment and punishment is not going to help my friend come to repentance. So this is a good principle. Abhor what is evil, but hold fast to what is good. So address things that are wrong and unhealthy in our friendships where we can speak truth to one another. But do it in a way that we don't let go of the greater good, which is our love for them. That we never want to tilt the scales in that direction. Then Paul goes on. Love one another with brotherly affection. In my travels throughout the world, in Africa, and my wife referred to this in her time in India, a lot of the men walk around holding hands. Just friendships holding hands. And I found it striking. I think coming from the Western world, which is very English um, in its influences, there's an aversion to expressing affection. There's reservation in expressing affection. And so what ends up happening is it leaves whole generations, both of men and women, longing for affection. And when that happens, it puts an unrealistic and unhealthy and unhelpful expectation upon finding all the affection that we need for our hearts as human beings solely within the realm of sexual affection. In a culture that can't express affection, it puts unhealthy expectations to find all the affection we need through sexual relationships. Paul here draws something else. He says brotherly or sibling affection, which is what? It's non-sexual affection, should be openly expressed. That that is the way that we should love one another is through open expressions of affection, both physical and emotional. He even commands the church to greet one another with a holy kiss. Now, obviously, that doesn't fit into our COVID regulations at this time. But this is the, this is the sibling, non-sexual relationships within the church should thrive with the ability to express love and care and tenderness and closeness to one another through physical and emotional expressions. If you know me, you know that I'm a quite affectionate person. I would be comfortable holding a brother or friend's hand. I love to hug and say how much I care about you. My wife was laughing at me the other day because I got off the phone with a friend and I always end with, I love you, man. It's great to talk. I bless you. Those are the words I end every or <laughs> conversation with is to go, I genuinely bless you. I want this day to be good for you. I love and appreciate you. Paul goes on to push it further. Not only should we show expressions of physical and emotional affection, men and women expressing their affection, but we should seek to outdo one another in showing honor. This is the only time I can think of throughout the whole of the scriptures where we are told to compete with one another. And we're told to compete with one another in expressing, showing honor. Lifting, celebrating, respecting, recognizing, affirming, encouraging, blessing, and supporting. That we would see the goodness of Christ in one another. We would see what we are created for. The Imago Dei image bearers. We would see the good and the wonderful and the beautiful. That we would do as Paul said earlier, hold fast 
to that good and then express that good and honor, show honor of that good. That regardless of the valley or the hardship or the sin that you are going through, we would value you, honor you, bless you, and lift you. It's the ability to say positive things to one another. As Christians, we can hear the phrases that we should confess our sins to one another and go, we should just talk about deep, hard things. But we should also be able to love loudly, talk about what we love and enjoy about one another. That I would be able to say of my friend Jeffrey, look at how good my friend Jeffrey is. Look at how he loves. Look at how he serves the Lord. Look at how he uniquely expresses the goodness of God. That I could do the same for Mike or for Susan or for Harold. To say, look at how Christ is shown in the life of Harold. Look at the goodness here. Man, I love this about you, brother. Sister, I... I celebrate this about you. I love the way. And so what we're doing is we're looking for beauty. We're looking for the divine. We're looking for gold in the life of our friends. And we're pulling it out and saying, everybody needs to see this. Look at how good this is. Look at the beauty here. Man, and, and so it, it comes out in phrases of like, I appreciate this about you. I love this about you. Man, I see this in your relationship with your kids. I love that. So what we want is to cultivate a culture within the church that can express affection, where I can grab my nephew, Jacob, grab him and say, Jacob, how you doing, buddy? How's your week going? So I'm giving him opportunity for his full self to be present and to be honest about his challenges. Then I can say, okay, Jacob, uh, I'm with you on that. I hear that. I'll pray about that. But also to be able to grab Jacob, and this is something I do quite often at our family dinners, I'll grab Jacob and say, Jacob, I want you to know I love who you are. I notice these things about you and I love them and I bless you. It's important to have multi-generational blessings within the church where we're grabbing them and saying, I love this about you and I bless this about you. That we're not always and only corrective, but we speak and show honor. Just like the father does to Jesus the son. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And just like Jesus will do to us, Lord willing, at the end of days, well done, good and faithful servant. The church should have the language of honor, just as it has the words of confession. We must be able to speak life as well as confess where death is at work amongst us. We must have both to have healthy, thriving, Jesus-centered friendships. So some questions to ask of yourself are, can I speak about what is good? Can I honor my friends? Can I celebrate and encourage them? Those are the things that we want to lean in today. Is to be with them in the darkness, embrace them in hardship, but also be able to exalt in them. Celebrate them, honor them, bless them, make great of them. All of this is the way of Jesus.
All my fear is swept away In everything I will trust in you There are is hope in the promise of the cross You gave everything to save the world you love And this hope is an anchor for my soul Our God will stand unshaken Changing one who was and is to come, your promise sure you will not let go. There are so much for joining us today at Christ Church. We are so thankful that you've come. It's been such a delight and joy to worship the Lord through this time and together, even online. 
And also just to remind you that we are gathering in person uh, here at uh, News Place Oceanside. It's been a joy to see each other and be together within the protocols required. It's just still been so great to gather together. So if you are in the region, we just welcome you to come join us in, in person for Christ Church. Uh, we also have started and opened our registration for our discipleship program, Pilgrims in the Way of Jesus. It's a program that starts in October the 18th and goes to May 30th. Uh, it's six week kind of snapshots as to the life and death and resurrection and ascension of Jesus. It's a beautiful time of deepening faith and bringing clarity to questions and personal journey. So we have a testimony actually of someone who's gone through the program that they want to share with you how it impacted them. I was asked to say a few words about Pilgrimage in the Way. Uh, that was a program that my husband and I just completed this last fall and we really enjoyed it. Um, for me, some of the, the big things that were really brought home to me was um, how much Jesus is the way and he's the provider for us. And that, you know, in the world, we have to be our own way and we have to provide totally for us because we can't trust or rely um, on resources other than ourselves. But with Jesus, we have the ability to turn to him. And so it's not only Jesus is the way in that we follow him, but Jesus is the way in that we rely on him to provide for us. Um, one of the things that really impacted me, this because this was a very comprehensive course, um, was when we looked at um, the sacrifice uh, that Jesus makes on the cross for us. And um, we all know that that's in, in terms of um, being saved from our sins. But um, what that also brought out is, is that God has provided so much more for us there. He has restored us into relationship with him. Um, he has uh, adopted us into his family and we have access to all his resources. Um, he has um, turned his anger, justifiably so, at sin. And we are now in a position of favor with him. Um, so we have um, got freedom. We're no longer slaves to sin. So there's just these, these extra layers that um, really meant so much because um, they become tools for your life. You can go, oh, no, 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 that's not true. I have the resources of God at hand because now I am a child of God. And that type of um, understanding about what Jesus has done is so important. Um, I would say this was a long program. It takes you from Genesis to Revelation. And, you know, that's going to take a while. It's very thorough and comprehensive. Um, it requires your engagement and reflection. But what became clear to me just by going through that whole process was that God's work and motivation is to heal, restore, and provide for all people, uh, for me, for you, for everyone, and that God is more than up to the task of healing, storing, restoring, and providing. So I think those for me were the um, really big takeaways. I'm very glad I did it. Uh, look forward to seeing what we're going to do in the fall. Thank you.